behalf of the Marino Office for Global Concerns, I just want to say how delighted we are to see all of you in this room. To have you here to celebrate the 100 years of Marino in mission with us here in Washington, D.C. is just wonderful. We've spent months of planning and scheduling, and we really look forward to continuing the whole mission of spreading peace, social justice, solidarity, and defending the integrity of creation with all of you for the next years ahead. I'd like to take the time now to introduce Robert Ellsberg. I'm sure a lot of you know Robert. This summer marks Robert's 25th anniversary with Aunt, with Mariel. He arrived in 1987 as the editor-in-chief of Orbis Books, and in 2006, he also assumed the role of publisher. Over these years, he's overseen the publication of over a thousand volumes. Robert spent five years from 1975 to 1980 working with the Catholic worker community in New York City, serving for two years as the managing editor of the Catholic worker newspaper. He later earned his master's degree from the master's degree from the theology, in theology from the Harvard Divinity School. And he's written and edited many award-winning books, including All Saints, Reflections on Saints, Prophets, and, and Witnesses of Our Time, The Saints' Guide to Happiness, and Blessed Among Women with Penny Lernew. Oh, and also with Penny Lernew, he co-authored Hearts on Fire, The Story of the Marinol Sisters, which was the theme of the Marinol Sisters Symposium just a few weeks ago. His most recent books are The Duty of Delight, The Diaries of Dorothy Day, and All the Way to Heaven, The Lectured Letters of Dorothy Day. So without much ado, I introduce to you Robert Elton. classic sign of paranoia when you believe that radio and TV broadcasts contain secret messages intended just for you. <laughs> and then I found myself wondering a couple of years ago whether Glenn Beck, the conservative commentator on the Fox uh -huh. Network, was obsessed with Orbis books. <laughs> Does anybody remember Glenn Beck? Yes. <laughs> kind of combination uh, Fulton Sheen, Joe McCarthy, Howdy Doody. <laughs> He's uh, lost his megaphone recently, but for a while there he was really on a roll. First, he launched a well-publicized campaign illustrated with copious charts and graphs on his blackboard warning against the dangers of social justice. Do you remember that one? <laughs> claimed that social justice was a code word for communism or Nazism, and he urged Christians to leave their church if they heard these words. If anybody inclined uh, to follow his advice, you're really in the wrong place tonight. <laughs> you probably should have left as soon as Janice McLaughlin got up. Many believed he was talking about the Catholic Church. After all, as Janice reminded us in the Synod of 1971, the bishops issued a document called Justice in the World in which they proclaimed that action on behalf of justice and participation in the transformation of the world fully appear to us as a constitutive dimension of the preaching of the gospel. That is, if it doesn't include the message of social justice, it's not really the gospel of Jesus Christ, which pretty much means you ought to walk out of any church in which you don't hear the word social justice. Personally, however, I suspected that Beck was really talking about Orbis books. <laughs> you might have been tipped off by any number of, of our titles, including Introducing Catholic Social Thought, or Donald Doerr's Option for the Poor, or Justice and Peace, a Christian Primer, which 
pretty much tells you about everything you need to know on the subject of social justice. But he might have been thinking of any number of Orvis titles. Then there was the show where he referred to Dorothy Day as a well-known Marxist. Of course, Dorothy Day has recently been proposed for canonization. So again, that sort of leads us back to the Catholic Church, but it also leads us right back to Orvis, where we've published four volumes of her writings and two biographies. You can see the pattern emerging here. And I had a blackboard appeal. For a while, he went on a tirade against our author, Jim Wallace, from Washington here, for serving as the spiritual brains behind the Obama administration. We wish. <laughs> then there was his attack on our author, James H. Cohn, the father of black theology. Beck believes that Cohn's theology leads directly to the socialist agenda of President Obama. But I believe it leads more directly to Orvis books. <laughs> After all, we've published all of Cohn's works, from A Black Theology of Liberation to his latest, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. You're being able to connect the dots here? <laughs> More recently, in his most explicit secret reference to Orbis books yet, <laughs> Glenn Beck targeted liberation theology. He was qualifying his earlier statement that President Obama is a racist with a deep-seated hatred of white people and white culture. And now he was saying he really should have targeted the president's theology, which is, are you ready, liberation theology. And here is Beck's definition of liberation theology. It's about oppressor and victim. That is a direct opposite of what the gospel is talking about. It's Marxism disguised as religion. The only thing that was being disguised here was Beck's deep-seated obsession with Orbis books. <laughs> Time does not allow me to uh, list every book we've published on this subject from Gustavo Gutierrez's classic The Theology of Liberation up to the present. But it occurred to me I ought to send Glenn Beck a copy of an Orbis classic which we recently ish reissued, Ernesto Cardinal's The Gospel of Solentaname. This extraordinary book originally published in the 1970s records the gospel commentaries of a community of peasants and artisans from a remote village in Nicaragua. There's no sophisticated theology here, certainly no references to Karl Marx. Instead, there's the spectacle, inspiring or frightening, depending on your perspective, of poor people reflecting on the life and message of Jesus in light of their social reality. Here's a commentary on Jesus' inaugural sermon in Nazareth, where he proclaims that he has been sent to give good news to the poor, to heal the afflicted in heart, announce freedom to the prisoners, and to give sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to announce the year of grace of the Lord. A campesino named William reflects, he's saying that he's the one. It's a message of pure liberation, the poor, the afflicted, the blind, the imprisoned. Another, Loriano, observes, the truth is that all those people, they're the poor. And another, Pedro, says, and you have to see as a contrast the negative part too. He didn't come to give any news to the rich, but to talk to the poor. He didn't come to give help to those who are happy, but to those who have problems, to the afflicted. He didn't come to, the, to be the ally of those who put people in jail, but to set the prisoner, prisoners free. And he didn't come to blindfold people's eyes, but to make them see. And he didn't come to oppress, but to put an end to oppression and to proclaim total liberation. But nobody falsifies these words, as so often happens. And he said it in church. And I thought, whoa. Wait a second. Could Jesus have been talking about Orbis books? <laughs> We're here to celebrate the centenary of Mary Noel, both the fathers and brothers and the Mary Noel sisters. And I was asked in particular to reflect on the social justice agenda of Mary Noel, which is obviously a lot larger than Orbis books. But I beg your pardon if I emphasize the Orbis story, partly because it's the story I'm most familiar with, but also because I think it reflects in a particular way how the social justice agenda has assumed an increasingly prominent role in the mission of Mary Orbis, as you probably know, was founded in 1970 as a project within the Mary Office of Social Communication. It was the brainchild of Father Miguel Descoto, who later went on to serve as foreign minister in the Sandinista government in Nicaragua causing all kinds of agita for the Vatican, the U.S. government, and not least for Mary. <laughs> God bless him. 
Father Miguel had the idea of starting a publishing house that would amplify theological voices from the third world, particularly in the beginning from Latin America. At any previous time, this would have been a vain undertaking. Previously, there was no sense that theology was shaped by social factors, that there was such a thing as third world or Latin American theology. There was just as we naively thought theology. But then in 1968, the Latin American bishops in Medellin, interpreting the teachings of the Second Vatican Council for their continent, began by examining their social context. And what stood out was a social reality marked by massive poverty, oppression, and violence. And to talk about the gospel in that context meant reflecting on the meaning of words like sin and grace and salvation in relation to those social structures. And out of this, a new way of doing theology was born. Gutierrez's book, A Theology of Liberation, was published in 1971. The English translation was published by Orbis Books in 1973. And it was followed by a steady stream of books by Leonardo Boff, John Sabrino, Juan Luis Segundo, Don Helbert Camara, Ignacio Ecoria, Oscar Romero, and countless others. And for years, this work pretty much characterized the program of Orbis Books. Regardless of what you thought of it, we were pretty much the English language conduit of Latin American liberation theology to the rest of the world. Of course, with their feet on the ground, Mary Nollers in Latin America and around the world were already experiencing this firsthand. Mary Nollers had always stood with the poor. But there was a big shift from practicing charity to questioning the structures that give rise to so much poverty. As Dom Helder Camara, the Holy Archbishop of Recife, Brazil, said, when I feed the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why there are so many poor, they call me a, a communist. And this involved a widening in the understanding of mission. Rather than simply bringing the good news of salvation to the poor in Latin America, Marian Olders were joining the church and making an option for the poor, an option to see the world and the gospel through the eyes of the poor. And in that light, to hear and recognize a whole new understanding of Jesus' mission, an understanding of how he entered into the conflictive social context of his time, and how that message threatened the powerful and resulted in his death. Oscar Romero noted that one who is committed to the poor must risk the same fate as the poor, which as he noted in El Salvador meant to disappear, to be tortured, to be captive, and to be found dead. Inspired by this message, it was no coincidence the two Marianal sisters in El Salvador should be among the many thousands to suffer this fate. And through Orbis books, Marianal was promoting a kind of reverse mission, helping to evangelize first world Christians through the gospel as lived and proclaimed by the world's poor. Three years ago, I had the privilege of leading a retreat on the Marianal founders for the society chapter. I was interested to discover that Many Marianal fathers didn't necessarily know a lot about Thomas Price and James A. Walsh. There were no official biographies in the archives, and this struck me as curious. A lot of religious congregations and societies consciously fashioned themselves on the spirituality of their founders. Marianal was different. The founders planted seeds and allowed them to grow in an organic way, so that in a sense, faithfulness to the founders didn't mean imitating their lifestyles or devotional habits or an outlook that was born in a particular time in the church. The founders planted a zeal for mission, but without defining that in a way that would prevent the idea from growing and changing over time, keeping pace with evolving understanding of the needs of the church and the needs of the world. The idea of mission has been shaped over the years by many factors, but among them are the experience and the wisdom of people around the world where Mary Nold has served. Their reading of the gospel has allowed the church to hear and recognize forgotten notes. And so we in the West found ourselves having to become a listening and learning church. From the church in Latin America, we became sensitized to the importance of social justice as a constitutive theme of evangelization. But from Africa, we learned in a special way the challenge of enculturation, the need to de-westernize the gospel, to root it in the themes and languages of other cultures. And from Asia, we learned about the challenge of religious pluralism and the fact that mission involves interreligious dialogue. 
And everywhere that Mary Knoll worked, we learned the importance of listening to the voices of those on the margins, particularly the voices of women, who hold up at least half the sky. All of these themes came to be reflected as well in the program of Orbis Books, to the point that we no longer divided our list into different geographical segments. We saw ourselves as dealing holistically with the global dimensions of faith. And so we continued, of course, to publish books by Latin American, and Asian, and African theologians. But all of our books were marked by a special concern for how Christian faith relates to the world. And in that sense, we were steadily growing into the implications of our name, Orbis, which means world. Not first world or third world, but one single world so loved by God, a world marked all too much by violence and injustice, a world that is blessed by diverse cultures and different religions, a world in which we are united by so many common hopes and dreams, yet also haunted by similar nightmares, particularly the peril of climate change and global warming, a situation that dramatizes for good or ill how much we are truly connected. And in this light, the idea of mission takes on yet another dimension as an exercise in solidarity. The impulse to reach out beyond our privatized culture of individualism, beyond our inward-looking parochialism, beyond our xenophobic fear of outsiders, aliens, and others, to realize and act upon the bonds of our common humanity, our oneness with our brothers and sisters across the globe. That ethic of solidarity is another expression of the mission of Mary Knoll and the mission of Orbis Books. Let me say a little bit more personally about how I came to Mary Knoll and Orbis 25 years ago. Naturally, it began with a book. Following the death of Oscar Romero and the death of the church women in El Salvador, I read Penny Lernu's classic book, Cry of the People, and it inspired me to travel to Latin America to learn for myself something about the changing role of the Catholic Church there. In 1983, I was studying Spanish at the Mary Knoll Language School in Cochabamba. And in the library, I found an Orbis book called Jesus Christ Liberator by Leonardo Boff. I stayed up all night reading that book, feeling at the end like the disciples on the road to Emmaus when their hearts burned within them. I felt as if I were hearing the gospel for the first time. Meanwhile, all around in Latin America, I was seeing evidence of the role that faith could play in empowering people, enabling them to confront systems of injustice and violence, inspiring them to act on the dream of a better world. In my travels, I met Mary Nollers, but also heroic bishops, missionaries, pastoral agents, and ordinary lay people who seemed to be reliving the apostolic era of the church. Everything was new. Everything seemed possible. And through reading other Orbis books, I discovered there was a theology that underlay this reinvention of the church. And it was the first time I really understood that theology was more than an academic exercise. It was a force, a source of life, a calling, a resource in the struggle for a better world. I decided to return to the US and study theology. Meanwhile, I had acquired the costly habit of buying just about anything published by Orbis. <laughs> For me, Orbis was more than a brand name. It represented an ethical stance, an engagement with the most critical social and spiritual issues of our time. So you can imagine my reaction when I got a call out of the blue in 1987 asking if I would consider becoming the editor-in-chief of Orbis. Sometimes the work of providence in our lives is mysterious and hard to discern, but this was not one of those moments. I accepted the invitation and never looked back. Those were extraordinary times. The debates and struggles over liberation theology and the future of the church were heated. I remember when John Sobrino called to say that his entire Jesuit community at the Central American University, including our author, Ignacio Ia Correa, had been massacred. My hero, Leonard Raboff, was silenced by the Vatican, later resigning the priesthood. Father Jean Bertrand Aristide, an obscure Haitian priest whose book in the parish of the poor we had just published was elected president of Haiti, only to be overthrown in a military coup. I remember getting up at dawn to watch on television as Nelson Mandela was released from prison and recognizing two of our authors, Alan Bosak and Frank Chicani, at his side. 
There was a time when there seemed to be a direct link between the books we were publishing and the unfolding of great historical drama. We had the opportunity to publish so many extraordinary books by prophets and witnesses of our time. Sister Diana Ortiz's The, the Blindfold Eyes, Jim Douglas's JFK and the Unspeakable, Guatemala Never Again, the Remy Human Rights Report, books by Joan Chittister, Daniel Berrigan, Jim Wallace, Albert Nolan, Henry Nowen, Thomas Berry, not to mention Judy Mayod, and Claudia Berry, Dennis McLaughlin, Marie Dennis. I mentioned the impact that Penny Lerlew had on my life, and as Kathy mentioned, one of the proudest accomplishments of my career was to complete her final book left unfinished at her death, Hearts on Fire, the story of the Marianne Sisters, which we just reissued for the Sister Centenary. History changes and a publishing house must also change. A publisher too must learn to read the signs of the times, to discern where the spirit is moving in the church and the world. Sometimes there's a great truth that must be spoken regardless of the consequences. Sometimes what is needed is a word of hope and healing. There are times when I look at what has become of all the hopeful struggles of the 1970s and 80s, particularly in Latin America, all the brave talk of a new way of doing theology, a new way of being church. And I look at the state of the world, the state of the church, and I wonder whether any of this has made a difference. Was it worth it? But then I remember from my own experience how my heart burned within me. I remember the power of a book at the right time and the right hands to change a life, to be a vehicle of grace and conversion, to open up new unforeseen possibilities for being in the world. And I know that theological publishing too can be a force, a calling, a source of life, a resource in the struggle to build a better world, especially in a dark and wintry time. And what of Mary and as we move into a new era of mission, the second century of our history? I had occasion to think about this while reflecting on the legacy of the Marinol founders. I was struck first of all by the fact that the founders never imagined that the message of Marinol was ultimately about Marinol. It was about something larger. Marinol served Christ's mission in the world and they envisioned that the meaning and form and priorities of mission could evolve and change over time. They believed that the object of Marinol's mission was not only overseas but also in America and the challenge and inspiration to the American church to fulfill its own mission, its own vocation and destiny. They did not believe the role of Marinol was to be the mission department for the American Catholic Church. Instead, they hoped to offer a leaven of mission consciousness that would change the character of the American church itself. In their view, the dozens, scores, or hundreds of Marinol priests, brothers, and sisters were not surrogates or substitutes for the missionary commitment of American Catholics. Instead, they served as a witness to the essential missionary character of the church as a whole. There's no doubt that Marinol today lives out of a, a phase of its history far removed from the expansive energy of the early years, an era that will not return. But it opens the way to another era, another role no less vital and important as a leaven of mission consciousness. The founders were acutely sensitive to the mission imperative of the gospel. They knew that the purpose of the church is not just to minister to its members, but to seek first the kingdom of God. They were appalled by the inward looking and complacent spirit of most American Catholics and challenged them to realize their role and responsibility within the universal body of Christ. A hundred years ago, Fathers Walsh and Price and Molly Rogers launched this enterprise. Yet that challenge remains. In a culture awash in material complacency, Muriel continues to amplify the voices of the poor. It highlights the encounter between the gospel and many cultures and challenges American Catholics to step outside their ethnocentric biases and claims of exceptionalism, to recognize God's love for all peoples, all races, God's presence in every culture and in all that is true and good in every religion. The seeds of Muriel lay in the field of mission education Perhaps that function is more important today than at any time in the past. To be sure, the understanding of mission is wider today. It is reflected not just in the proclamation of the gospel, but in the living out of the gospel, here and abroad, 
Wherever Christians dedicate themselves to the cause of peace or confront social injustice, or engage in in a religious dialogue and reconciliation, or embrace the ideal of global solidarity or compassionate service among their neighbors. In all these ways, Christians share in the mission of Christ in the world. In the end, the spirit of Mary Knoll is not confined to the ever smaller number of professed members of the society or congregation who serve overseas. It is reflected in a movement that includes the lay missioners, the affiliates, the lay employees and partners in mission, a movement that never lets American Catholics forget that we belong to a world church, that we are truly our global brothers and sisters keepers, and that we are not truly disciples of Christ unless we share his mission. I was very touched by the story of Molly Rogers and how she found her vocation through her encounter and association with James A. Walsh, who was then director of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith in Boston. I was unknown to him, she would later write, but in my soul there was already lighted a spark of apostolic fire that awaited the gentle breath of heaven to fan it into a living flame. He was to be that flame. I would suggest that the future of Mary Knoll lies in discerning and fanning the sparks of apostolic fire in the American church today. Mary Knoll has a wonderful legacy and a vast body of experience, but we cannot do it alone. I believe in the spirit of the founders that we need to seek out and locate the sparks of mission consciousness or apostolic fire in the church today and fan them into flame. Where can we find such sparks? In the thirst for a more engaged spirituality, in the idealism of youth and their instinct for the heroic, in movements of global solidarity, in struggles for human rights and social justice, in efforts to protect the environment, in the cause of peace and nonviolence, in the encounter between different faiths? How can we highlight these causes and relate them to the gospel and the mission of the church? The challenge today as we celebrate this signal anniversary is to discern wherein lies the essential spirit of Mary Knoll, a vision born from the founders, but not defined by the particularities of their personalities or the limitations of their historical horizons. And to, term, to de- and to determine how that relates to the signs of our times. Recently, Orbis published a book by Wes Howard Brook called Come Out My People, God's Call Out of Empire in the Bible and Beyond. Basically, he analyzes the entire Bible in terms of a running tension between two kinds of religion, not the religion of the Old Testament and the religion of the New Testament, but between what he calls the religion of empire and the religion of creation. You can read the entire Bible in terms of that tension. The religion of empire erects a sacred canopy over the dominant order, the rule of the rich and powerful over the poor and powerless, the rule of men over women, the domination of the earth. The religion of creation, on the other hand, affirms community, equality, social justice, an affirmation of those on the margins, a holistic view of the relation between God, humanity, and the earth. It's a running motif throughout the Old Testament, in Genesis, Exodus, and the prophets, and it is taken up by Jesus, who instead of representing a whole new religion, becomes the heir and summit of that tradition, and whose spirit moves us to carry it forward. Back in the 1970s and 80s, Orbis, Orbis published many books that dealt with the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. The books we published by many of the leading South African theologians represented the religious or church-based dimension of that struggle. It was a long struggle that depended on many dimensions with political, cultural, and economic fronts. But I dare say the religious dimension proved very significant, perhaps the tipping point. Today the world faces many challenges critical to human survival and flourishing. The growing gap between the rich and the poor, the struggle for scarce resources, the crisis of climate change, which calls into question the very sustainability of life on Earth, the problem of militarism, war, and the proliferation and threat of nuclear weapons. Against this is the dream of a more just, sustainable, peaceful, and inclusive world. There are many dimensions to the struggle for such a world, but one of these is the religious factor. Who can say if that will prove to be the tipping point, the critical factor in the struggle? And that is another way of describing our efforts. 
It is another way of describing the mission of Mary Knoll and the mission of Orvis Books. To lend our efforts to the religious and theological dimension of the struggle for a more just, sustainable, and peaceful world. The value of these efforts cannot be measured in the short term. It is an investment in a long-term change in worldviews and religious consciousness, the possibility of a spiritual awakening and renewal that is vitally important for the fate of this planet and all who share it. We, are more, we know more clearly than we did 100 years ago or 40 years ago how much we are all connected by global markets, by the currents of culture, by the tentacles of mass media, and by the delicate threads of ecology. But we also know that global connections extend to the spiritual realm. Anything that enlivens our spirits, renews our hopes, or moves our hearts to compassion ultimately contributes to the balance of love in the world and advances the cause of peace. I'm so grateful for the part that Marinol has play, played in that effort over the past hundred years and for the opportunity along with so many here to have played a small supporting role. Bless the sacred history and the sacred cause of God's ongoing mission. May God enlarge our faith and give us courage, hope, and patience for the mission that lies ahead. Peace and blessings to you all. Yeah.